this morning I want to ask you to consider how does the gospel of Jesus, how does the gospel of Jesus connect to the people of Israel and to the promises of Israel? Now, another way to put that question would be, how does the New Testament relate to the Old Testament? These are very important questions for us to ask, and how we answer these questions really affect how we view the coming of Jesus, how we view the work of Jesus, how we view the plans and promises of God from eternity past to eternity future. And this morning, as we turn to the first four verses of of the book of Romans, Paul's letter to Romans, we're reminded that the Old and New Testaments are not two distinct stories with two distinct plans of salvation. We're reminded that the gospel of God, that, that, that good news of what God has done for us and in us through Jesus, that the gospel was not God's plan B after his plan A didn't work out. Rather, we're going to see this morning that the gospel was actually promised long ago from from God's eternal plan, from eternity past, and was then brought to fulfillment and fullness in the coming and in the work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I, I love the story that I read this week of the recently deceased pastor, Tim Keller. Keller confessed that as a young Christian, he often found the Old Testament to be really confusing and honestly an off-putting part of the Bible. He often struggled with the seeming disjointedness of the Old Testament and the New Testament. But Keller was describing in this article of a time when he was at a study center with the great scholar Alex Motyer, who was addressing this sort of uh, disjointedness between the Old and New Testaments. And in that lecture, Dr. Motyer insisted that We are all one people of God, and in order to illustrate this, he asked the class to imagine how the Israelites under Moses would have given their testimony if someone would have asked for it. Motyer says that an Israelite would have answered with something along these lines. Well, we were in a foreign land, in bondage, under the sentence of death. But our mediator, the one who stands between us and God, came to us with the promise of deliverance. And we trusted in those promises of God. We took shelter under the blood of the Lamb, and he led us out. Now we are on the way to the promised land. We're not there yet, of course, but we have the law to guide us. And through blood sacrifice, we also have his presence in our midst. So he will stay with us until we get to our true country, to our everlasting home. And then Maltier concluded by saying this. Now think about it. A Christian could today could say that testimony almost word for word. You see, though though there's certainly a newness to the new covenant, it is a new covenant after all, the new covenant and the gospel of Jesus is not novel. It is not unprecedented. Rather, the new covenant established through the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, those things that we refer to as the gospel, those things are and have been God's eternal plan all the way from eternity past. From the very first words of Scripture, we find partial fulfillment, we find shadows, we find types throughout the, New Test- or the Old Testament, all that find its ultimate fulfillment in what Paul is going to speak of this morning, in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So let me invite you to turn with me, if you're not already there, to the book of Romans, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 again in full this morning. Again, as these verses, as I said last week, comprise one sentence in the original Greek. I just want you to hear them all together. And then we're going to hone in specifically on verses 2 through 4 this morning. God's word says this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see two things this morning as we walk through these three verses. I want us to see both the promise of the gospel as well as the person of the gospel. We're going to see first in verse 2, uh, guys, my clicker's not working, so if you don't mind advancing that. We're going to see first in verse 2 the promise of the gospel. The gospel is good news, but the gospel is not new news. The gospel is not some theological novelty. It's not a divine afterthought in the mind of God. The gospel was not first taught in the New Testament. The gospel does not reflect a change in God's plan of salvation or a revision of his strategy. As one author put it, the gospel is not a break with the past. Rather, it is the continuation and the consummation of it. Now, remember last week I gave you several purposes for why Paul wrote this letter, and we said that one of the purposes was an apologetic one. That is, Paul was defending his ministry. He was defending his apostleship from false rumors about things that he was teaching and preaching. He was frequently accused, like he was in Acts 21, of actually preaching and teaching against the law of Moses and of proclaiming some revolutionary message that was unheard of in ancient Judaism. And so perhaps here from the very beginning, for the sake of his Jewish critics, he's going to start his epistle by noting that the gospel that he is proclaiming, the gospel that he has been set apart for, is not something that originated with him. Rather, the gospel is something that was promised long ago. We see first that the gospel was promised through God's prophets. He uses here the word prophets to refer not just to the Old Testament prophets like we would think of them, like Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Isaiah. He's re using this word to refer to all of the Old Testament writers in general who were spokesmen of God. And secondly, if you'll progress to that second one, we see that the gospel was promised through God's word or the Holy Scriptures as he put it. Have you ever noticed if you take your Bible that you're holding in your hands, look at the spine of your Bible, what do those words say on the spine, no matter what your translations say? They say Holy Bible, don't they? Why do we think that is? Why doesn't it just say the Bible or Bible? Well, it's because as Paul calls them here in Romans 1, these writings of God, they are holy. They are unique. They are distinct. They are set apart. They are different. This book that you hold in your hands is unlike any book ever written in the history of the world. From the best to the worst, here in these writings, here in these scriptures, we have the very words of the one God of the universe. The very words of God himself disclosing to us who he is, disclosing to us who we are, disclosing to us the plan of salvation that he has laid out for us. I think, again, thinking about that apologetic purpose of God, Paul likely mentions here the Holy Scriptures specifically to contrast the rabbinical writings of his day that were very often more studied and more zealously cared for than the actual scriptures themselves. The actual words and the actual teachings of the Old Testament were almost an afterthought for the Jews of Jesus' day. They were almost some relics of an ancient past. What the people, what the Jews really cared about were not the scriptures, they cared about the teachings of the rabbis. Those rabbis who fleshed out and added to the scriptures. And though those writings said little or nothing about the gospel of God, Paul makes it clear here in verse 2 that these writings, God's holy scriptures, had much to say about it. And over and over in Jesus' earthly ministry, he had to combat these teachings of the rabbis that had become deeply embedded in the Jewish uh, people through these rabbinical books. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, you had Jesus over and over utter this phrase, you have heard it said... When Jesus is referring to you have heard it said over and over in the, the Sermon on the Mount, he's not referring to the words of these holy scriptures. He's not referring to the Old Testament. Rather, he is referring to the rabbinical traditions that contradicted the actual law of 
the Old Testament. Jesus himself writes this or says this in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but I have come to what? To fulfill them. Later, Jesus, after he had been risen from the dead, was walking with the men on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. He rebukes them in verse 25. O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then he tells Luke tells us in verse 27 that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see, the entire Old Testament that we hold in our hands in one sense is about the gospel. The whole Old Testament in one sense is about Jesus. In one way or another, the entire Old Testament points us forward to Jesus, reminds us of our need for Jesus, gives us a shadow or a type of the Jesus of Jesus who will come, who causes us to long for the coming of Jesus. The entire thing, whether explicit or implicit, is pointing us forward to what Paul is talking about here in these first few verses, the gospel of God. And then we have the explicit prophecies throughout the Old Testament, at least 330 of them. Prophecies about the Christ, prophecies about the Messiah, most of which were fulfilled at Jesus' first coming. Every single Jewish prophet, whether directly or indirectly, prophesied about the ultimate prophet that was to come, Jesus Christ. Every Jewish sacrificial lamb spoke of and pointed to the ultimate eternal lamb who would come and be sacrificed for the sins of his people. Every Jewish law revealed and exposed our sin before a holy God, our need for forgiveness, and our need for the coming Savior, Jesus Christ. We see this from the very beginning in the first pages of Scripture. From the very first book in God's word, in his curse against the serpent, in Genesis 3.15, following that sin of Adam and Eve, we have what is known as the Proto-Evangelium, or the first gospel. God promises Satan there in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Everything that follows Genesis 3.15 is really just an unfolding of that promise, is an unfolding of that enmity that takes place between the offspring of God or the offspring of the woman and the offspring of Satan. And it all looks forward to and finds its culmination in the crushing of Satan's head by the offspring of that woman, Jesus Christ. Later in Deuteronomy 18, Moses looks forward to a prophet like him whom the Lord would raise up who would actually, to whom the people would actually listen. The promise is given to David later in 2 Samuel 7 that God would raise up from one of his offspring the one who would establish his kingdom and throne forever. We're going to look at that in more detail in just a moment. Throughout the Psalms, you have the Psalms looking forward to and longing for the coming of God's promised one. Throughout the prophets, especially think about Isaiah, Isaiah 53 and on points us to that coming Messiah that would be the fulfillment to all that God's people had longed for and looked to for centuries before. And then you have passages like Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 that anticipate the coming of a new covenant made by God with his people. Just listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah. You can turn there if you'd like, or you can just listen. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And then the New Testament writers echo this very same thing. Two passages very quickly. Hebrews 1, 
verses 1 through 2. The author writes, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, as we've been looking at already so far this morning. But in these last days, he says, he has spoken to us by his Son. And later in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, Peter writes this concerning this salvation, this gospel that we're talking about this morning. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent, subsequent glories. You see Peter saying they were searching over and over and everything they're writing is looking forward to and pointing forward to that day. And he continues by saying it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Listen, we could go on and on on this throughout this morning. We could just look through the Old Testament verse after verse, passage after passage after passage. But you see, brothers and sisters, Paul is reminding us this morning just as he was reminding the Roman church and the Jews of his day to whom he was writing, the gospel is good news, but the gospel is not new news. The gospel, God established a new covenant in the gospel, no question. But the coming of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the reign of Jesus, all of these things that comprise what we're talking about when we speak of the good news of the gospel— these things were not made up by God on the fly. These things were not uh, something that God came up with because his first plan did not work. Rather, the gospel was promised from the earliest pages of Scripture and was set forth in the eternal plan of God before the foundation of the world, that he would save for himself a people through the work of his Son. So that is the promise of the gospel. Well, now it is to that son that we'll turn for the rest of our time this morning as Paul looks not just to the promise of the gospel, but he looks secondly, still not working. It's okay, just progress. There's only three, three, three things. As he turns secondly to the person of the gospel. Listen, it is so important for us to remember this morning that first and foremost, God's gospel is not about us. The gospel, first and foremost, is not about us. Rather, the gospel is, as Paul says here in verse 3, the gospel is concerning his son. One of the greatest errors that we can do, and listen, it is done so often, is to actually place ourselves at the center of the gospel that we proclaim. The gospel is the gospel of God, which means it's God's gospel, not ours. The gospel is concerning the Son, which means first and foremost, it is the good news concerning Jesus Christ, not us. We must remember this for a couple reasons. First, we remember this lest we think that the gospel is ours to alter in any way. As God's gospel, he defines it, not us. We simply proclaim it. That means we have no license to change the gospel. We have no freedom to soften the gospel. We have no wiggle room to water down the gospel. Listen, if people are offended by the truth that they are sinners that stand in judgment before a holy God and are in need of forgiveness and reconciliation with that God through Jesus Christ, if they are offended by that truth, so be it. It is not our truth that we came up with. They ultimately must take that up with God because it is God who defines the gospel not us. We are simply good stewards of the good news that God himself has laid down for us. But we also remember that the gospel is God's gospel, not ours, lest we place ourselves at the center of the focus of the gospel. Again, first and foremost, it is a message about God, about his character and his actions for us through Christ. We need to remember this lest when we're sharing with those, sh sharing in evangelism, uh, the gospel with those, uh, that, that we don't make the mistake of making the central focus something about something missing in their lives. Uh, make the central focus be a God-shaped hole in their lives that only God can fill. 
Listen, if, if that is our starting point, if our starting point is something about them, if our starting point is something with them as the focus, then we're making the spotlight center on ourselves rather than center on God. We're making the spotlight center on something that makes us happy, makes us fulfilled, makes us feel joy, rather than centering on what God has done to reconcile sinners through Christ. I love this quote by Tim Keller when he wrote this. The gospel's content is his son. The gospel centers on Jesus. It is about a person, not a concept. It is about him, not us. We never grasp the gospel until we understand that it is not fundamentally a message about our lives, our dreams, our hopes. The gospel speaks about and transforms all of those things, but only because it isn't about us. It is a declaration about God's son, the man Jesus. So what is it then that we learn about this son this morning? What are those things that Paul is going to point us to? Well, in one sense, the rest of the letter is a fleshing out about what this gospel is. So, so we certainly aren't going to say everything this morning. Uh, certainly not going to cover everything in the gospel. But Paul points us to three things that we learn about Jesus this morning. He points us to the humanity of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. So let's take those one at a time. First, he reminds us of the humanity of Jesus. He begins there in verse 3 concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. Now, Jesus' Davidic heritage is important both in terms of his humanity as well as in terms of fulfilled prophecy. In terms of fulfilled prophecy, it's important for us to remember that both his natural mother, Mary, and his legal father, Joseph, both were descendants of David. We learn this from Luke 3, 21 and 31, and Matthew 1, 6, and verse 16. This was incredibly important because it fulfilled the prophecy of 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 and 13, known as the Davidic covenant, God promised David this, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This was a central promise for the people of Israel, the people of God, throughout the centuries that followed this promise in 2 Samuel 7. Over and over and over, we see the Old Testament writers point back to this promise. We see it often cited and rehearsed throughout the Psalms, such as Psalm 89, as the psalmist saying of the day that the Davidic son would come and rule again and reign. We see the prophet Isaiah build on this promise when he writes in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 5, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, that being David's father, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ear hears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. We see the prophet Jeremiah pick up on the same promise. He declares in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called the Lord is my righteousness. You see, the reason that this is specifically mentioned by Paul here, and the reason why so many New Testament writers, including Matthew, famously in his introductory genealogy, make it crystal clear that Jesus comes from the line of David, the reason this happens is because throughout the Old Testament, we see that the Messiah had to be a descendant of David. And as that descendant of David, then Jesus inherits the right to restore and to rule David's kingdom, that promised kingdom that would be without end. And so Paul is, is pointing us to this fact. He's reminding us here this morning that Jesus, as a descendant of David, is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. It's also important for us to just be reminded generally 
of the humanity of Jesus in this phrase. We're reminded here in this phrase that the eternal second person of the Trinity was born into a fallen humanity and shared human life with all of humanity, identifying himself with fallen humankind, yet without sin. In another epistle of Paul's, he famously declares the incarnation of Jesus this way. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, now here's where we're going to pick up him describing Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We go on and we see evidences throughout the Gospels and throughout the rest of the New Testament that Jesus literally became a physical human being. We see this in the fact that he had a human body, just like every human that has ever lived. He was born a baby. He grew up in childhood. He got tired. He got thirsty. He became hungry. He became physically weak. Over and over, the testimony of Scripture is clear that Jesus was really a man. We see that he had a human mind. Luke 2.52 tells us that he increased in wisdom. This is the Gospel writers teaching us that Jesus went through a learning process, just like we all do. He learned how to eat. He learned how to talk. He learned how to walk. He learned how to read and write and so forth. He had a human mind. And we see the gospel writers and the scriptures tell us that he had human emotions. He marveled at the faith of the centurion in Matthew 8. He wept with sorrow at the death of Lazarus in John 11. He prayed with a heart full of emotion in Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, the author tells us there with loud cries and tears. It's so important for us to remember this morning to fully affirm the humanity of Jesus when we speak of the gospel. Listen, Jesus did not just seem or appear to be a human. He was not half human, half God. All of these are heresies that have been declared as such throughout church history. No, Jesus was fully human, just as fully human as he was fully God. The only difference was that he was fully human without sin. The author of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 15 tells us as much. Here's the reason that this is so important for us to remember this morning. Without him being fully human, Jesus could not and Jesus would not have been our Savior. Jesus could not and Jesus would not have been our mediator, and he could not and would not have been our substitute sacrifice for sin. Jesus had to be fully human for representative obedience. Jesus was our representative and obeys for us where Adam failed and disobeyed. We see that parallel between the the two temptations, that of Jesus and that of Adam in Luke 4 and Adam's in Genesis 2. The one obeyed while the other disobeyed. Paul puts it clearly. We'll look at this in detail later when we get in chapter 5. But listen to what he says in verses 18 and 19 here in Romans Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one right man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Jesus also had to be fully human in order to be a substitutional sacrifice. If Jesus had not been a man, he could not have died in our place and paid the penalty that was due us. Hebrews puts it clearly in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, that is us. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for their sins of the people. And he had to be fully human in order to be the one mediator between God and man, as we're told he is in Titus. Because we were alienated from God by sin, we needed someone to come back and be the representative between us and God. We need a mediator who can represent us to God and a mediator who can represent God to us. And there's only one person who is ever able to fulfill that, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Well, not only was Jesus fully human, but if you'll go to that next slide there. He was also fully God. We're reminded here 
as Paul continues, not only of the humanity of Jesus, but of the deity of Jesus. We see this in two ways, both in his, the designation there in the beginning of verse 3 of Jesus as his son, as well as the end of verse 4, as Paul refers to him as Jesus Christ, our Lord. First, he's called here God's son. Jesus is God's unique son, the eternal son, not created, not, not redeemed, not adopted sons as you and I are through Jesus, but Jesus is the son in the sense of equality with the father, the eternal second person of the Trinity. He himself declares himself such in John 10 verse 30, I and the father, he says, are one. In the very first verse of John's gospel, John declares, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in that final book of the New Testament, in Revelation 1.8, we hear Jesus proclaim, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And Paul also refers to him there at the end of verse 4 as Jesus Christ, our Lord. That title here that he refers to him as Lord, Curios, this was a title that would have been reserved for God alone. And so here at the beginning of Paul's declaration of the person of the gospel, and at the end of his declaration of the person of the gospel, he's making it crystal clear to his readers that this Jesus is, was man, no doubt, but he was no mere man. He was man, as we just saw. He humbled himself to become a man, but he was no mere man. He was the God-man, fully God and fully man. It's as it has been famously put by various people throughout the years, remaining what he had always been, that being God, he became something he had never been, that being man. So we see in the person of the gospel, not only the humanity of Jesus, we see the, uh, the deity of Jesus, and finally, we see the resurrection of Jesus. Now, there's some who think that in reading verses 2 through 4, that Paul is actually contrasting the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus between verses 3 and 4. Notice these two parallel phrases. Both begin with was something. So, verse 3, concerning his son, first one, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and secondly, the one who was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Now, I certainly think, as we just said, that Paul is pointing us to the deity of Jesus in these verses. We see it in the designation of God's Son and Jesus Christ our Lord. But I don't think the divinity of Jesus is what Paul is point, putting forward at the forefront here in verse 4. Rather, Paul is pointing us here to that pivotal moment in the work of Jesus where Jesus, verse 4, is declared, or actually I think a better translation here would be appointed or demonstrated to be the Son of God with power, with sovereign strength. Paul's pointing us here to the fact that the resurrection of Jesus was that pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry that marked the end of his humiliation on earth and initiated the beginning of his exaltation into glory. It's important to note here that the resurrection did not make Jesus the Son of God. That's why verse 4 declared can kind of be a tricky word or, or a confusing word for us. We have to make sure we understand he was not made to be the Son of God by his resurrection. That would be an adoptionistic Christology. That's one that would be foreign to the teaching of scripture and to orthodox Christianity. The resurrection did not make Jesus the son of God. Rather, the resurrection declared and revealed in a powerful way what had always been true, that this is God's son. Now notice there the placing of that descriptive phrase in power. Pretty much every translation, I'd venture to guess every translation you're holding in your hands, has the same word order here, and I think it's the correct one, and it's important. Notice that the word order is not that he was declared with power to be the Son of God, right? or he was declared in power to be the Son of God. In that sense, in power would be describing the verb declared. Now, I know for many of you, your eyes are glazing over because it's a grammar lesson, but it's important for us, right? So in power there would be describing, declared. It would be Paul saying, this was a powerful declaration. But that's not what he says. 
Rather, the word in power describes not the verb declared, but describes the Son of God. Paul is pointing us here to the sovereign strength, the sovereign power that was appointed to Jesus following his resurrection. You see, in his earthly life and ministry, he was the Messiah, he was the Son of God, but he was humbled as a human, as the seed of David. But upon his resurrection from the dead, he is now enthroned as the Messiah King. He was now the Son of God in power. It's following his resurrection that Peter declares him at Pentecost in Acts 2 as God has made him both Lord and Christ. God has appointed him both Lord and Christ. It's following his work on the cross and the resurrection of the dead that Paul continues in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, writing, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, it is at the resurrection of Jesus. It is at his resurrection that he is appointed, he is declared, he is demonstrated to be now the Son of God, not in weakness as we saw him in his human form, but he is now declared to be the Son of God in power and is one step away from being enthroned to the right hand of God at his ascension where he sits now and reigns forevermore until his return. Notice what Paul says as he continues there in verse 4, that this resurrection was according to the spirit of holiness. This is a reference here for us to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit working in Jesus who accomplished the resurrection of Jesus and accomplished every other miracle performed by him or associated with him. I love how MacArthur puts it when he writes this. In the incarnation, Jesus Christ was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the resurrection, he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of holiness. So listen, here's what I hope we don't miss this morning as we end our time here in verses 2 through 4. Do not miss this morning both the promise of the gospel as well as the person of the gospel. The good news of what Jesus has done to save his people from their sins. This good news is the fulfillment of promises and prophecy from the very beginning of God's word revealed to us. It's rooted and founded in the eternal plan from eternity past. And this good news is first and foremost and foundationally the story of a person. Of the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived a perfect life, who died a sacrificial death, and who raised victoriously to life to save his people from their sin fully and finally. Don't miss this morning that this Jesus is Jesus, the one who saves his people from their sins. He is Christ, the one who has been anointed by God as king and priest, and he is Lord, the one who is God and is the sovereign ruler over all the universe. My prayer for us this morning is that every single one of us in this room would turn our eyes to this Jesus, would place our faith and hope in this Jesus. It is only through faith and repentance in Jesus that we can find forgiveness of our sin and reconciliation with the God of the universe. I want to end this morning by reading the lyrics of a song that I was reminded of as I was reading through Romans 1, 1 through 4 this week. It reminded me of a song, perhaps you've heard, perhaps you haven't, by Sovereign Grace called The Gospel Was Promised. And it just echoes the very truth that we learn this morning from God's word. The song goes like this. The gospel was promised by sages and prophets. The scriptures spoke of a son, descendant of David and yet uncreated, clothed in our flesh he would come. Predestined to seek us, He took on our weakness and died our death on the cross. But just as was spoken, the grave could not hold him, the glorious Son of God. And then the chorus just sings, His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's go now to God's throne of grace in the name of this Jesus, our Lord, as we prepare to come to the table and receive these elements.